Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you, to share with you. Thank you for the privilege, Pastor Louis. I think I'd like to just start by wrapping up that last section of the farewell to our family with a couple of thank yous from my side. Um, I think firstly, I want to say thank you to everyone. I've been part of this household now for about 21 years. So some of you might know me well, some of you might not know me at all, but that's fine because we're part of the same family of God. That's what he does. He joins us into his family and then we're family and then you have to put up with a chat from me even if you don't know me. That's how it goes. So I want to thank each one of you. Um, I've, as a family, we've been in homes, we've had meals, we've been in prayer times, we've engaged, served together, walked alongside. It's just been so many different people at different times who've put something into our lives, taught us something of God and displayed something of what Kingdom Family could and should look like. And even if it just comes to this very moment, being in this place together, worshiping our amazing King together, the fact that we're doing it together has blessed my life, has blessed our lives. The way that you engage with God, the way that you lift your praises unto Him, ignite something in the atmosphere, it shifts something for our atmosphere. It makes it so blessed to be part of the household of God. I want to thank every one of you. And a special just mention, I suppose, to the leadership teams over the year, the elders that we've been able to serve with, serve, be part of. I've learned so much from each one of you in different ways, shapes, and forms. I'm not going to go into everyone's names, but there's many people who've led and served in that capacity, and we've learned and grown together, and thank you. I think, um, aside from the fact that I could go probably through a lot of individuals, I really want to thank the Els family, and I'd like to start again. This is a repeat from the first service, but it's not onerous because it's on my heart. <laughs> I'm so grateful to you. I want to start with Edna. I say thank you again. Thank you very much for who you are in our lives. Thank you for the role that you've played. Thank you for loving us and caring about us as a family. And I thank you for who you are in the midst here, in the body of Christ. Your gift, the gift you are to the body. Um, I don't know how well you know Pastor Edna, but she's a woman of the word and a woman of the spirit, as I said before. <laughs> we, so many times we sit in meetings and we get stuck from time to time. And it's Pastor Edna who will call up the meeting and say, hang on guys, let's just pray. Let's just align ourselves with God afresh. Let's remember what the Word of God says. And, um, and just personally from me, I, I, I mentioned it, I'll mention it again. That, I mean, that time in my second year at VGY, I was just a random student in the corner that you didn't really know. I couldn't pay my fees at the end of my second year, and I didn't have a plan. And thank you for your generosity. That passed Edna out of her own savings. I wasn't supposed to know this, but somehow I find out. Out of her own savings, she came and paid for my fees allowed me to be here, allowed me to grow and be part of this family. That's the heart of this woman that is the mother in this household, and I thank you. Pastor Louis, I want to thank you as well. Um, it's been such a road that we've walked together. Sometimes when I say together, sometimes you're walking and me following, but most of the time. <laughs> but I've been blessed. Um, again, just your kindness to me, believing in me when I haven't believed in myself. It's, that's who Pastor Louis is. It's what he does. He sees kingdom purpose and destiny in people before they even know what it means. And you call it out, and you endure and long suffer with us, and you've done it with me. I'll share that little story again. I'd been on staff here for about three days. My first day, I came in my best clothing I had, nice shirt, nice pants, nice shoes, ironed, beautiful. Next day, I came back wearing the same clothes, not so ironed, not so beautiful. Third day, I came back in the same clothes. This was all I had. Pastor Louis was walking past my office and he stopped. He took a couple steps back, looked at me, he said, come with me. And he took me down to the local Markham's, I think it was called, and bought me like 10 outfits of clothing. And then over the next few days, taught me how to wear that properly as well. <laughs> it's the heart of the man. He cares, he's generous. He's blessed because he's generous. He never stops giving. And I thank you. Anyway, I can't say enough, but I thank you. Louis at the back, just again to, to mention... I love you. It's been a pleasure growing in our friendship together and starting to walk things out the last few years. We've had numerous chats where we're just able to share deep things in our hearts and, and be there for each other, and I appreciated it. It always means that relational connection means everything, you know? It makes everything else we do worthwhile. 
I celebrate you and who you are in this household and who you are as a gift to the body of Christ. I don't know how well you know, Louis, but um, in my mind, what I observe and have observed, he's got an apostolic calling on his life. God uses him and has anointed him to break things open in people's lives. He's done it in my life. He spends a bit of time with you, and he somehow speaks to you, encourages you, guides you, and just, just he's got this ability and anointing on him that something breaks open in your life, and you go to another level. You go to another level. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in all the staff around us, and you'll see it in your own lives if and when you get the privilege of engaging with them more and more. Love you, Louis. Appreciate you in my life. Um, and so, as Pastor Louis said, by the way, these relationships are ongoing. That is the joy of being part of the household of God. But I'm going to dive into my sermon. Um, I trust it will be God's word for us today. I'm titling it, Growing Up in the Household of God. And I needed it. I really needed it. When I arrived here 21 years ago, I was broken. I was nowhere. Relationally, I couldn't engage with people. I didn't know how to talk to people. I'd literally say to people, I'd be in a conversation and I'd say, I don't know how to talk to people. (laughs) I mean, who says stuff like that? Task, ability, responsibility, anything and everything was too much. I couldn't handle any level of responsibility. Um, Just before I came, I remember I was in New Zealand. I'd been mindful to learn to play the guitar, so I'd arrange this weekly lesson. It was so stressful for me. A half hour guitar lesson with some young guy that, you know, I didn't even know. He didn't know me. It didn't matter. A half hour lesson, like three, four days before, I, I just had sleepless nights knowing that this responsibility, this thing was coming up and it was all too much. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't complete my studies. My life fell apart. I was suicidally depressed. That was most of my reality most of the time. And this is, this is what arrived here. I got born again a couple of weeks before I arrived in Jeffries, which is awesome. But when I came here, I was still pretty messed up. And, um, and God, I want to encourage you today. God, in your life, God can do anything. He can heal everything. He will heal everything. That's what he does. That's the price that has been paid. He can change everything. He can shift every circumstance. He can change the motives of your heart. People can't do that. You can't do that yourself, but he can do it for you. As you're sitting here today, I want you to open your heart to him right now. The Holy Spirit is going to minister to into your hearts today. God wants to shift you. He wants to get you on a track, on, on a journey with him that is so exciting and revolutionary. You, don't, you won't know where you can end up because it's beyond what you can conceive. The ability, the calling he's put inside of you, it's from him. You don't have to self-generate. So what I want to share around today, I think there's three areas. I didn't know how to focus what I wanted to share because there was a lot. Yesterday morning I woke up, and as I woke up in that time with God, God just said to me, I want you to tell my people how much I love them. I want you to tell my people what I've brought them into and I want you to tell my people what I've got for them. So I'm going to try and do that a little bit. Um, rest assured, it won't be complete. There's a million, billion things he's brought you into. There's a, an amazing treasure trove of what he's got for you. And the incomprehensible, unending love of God can't be conveyed in a few sentences, but we'll do what we can. Um, so let's turn to John 3, verse 16. The love of God. This is such a beautiful scripture. It was Nicodemus, I think, who had snuck in in the, in the dark hours of night because he was, I think, embarrassed to be seen with Jesus in the day, but desperate to know some treasures of the kingdom. And Jesus started sharing with him some treasures of the kingdom. And he said this. This is so foundational in our walk, is it not? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Actually, I've got no idea how to preach this really well. I'm just going to say it a couple of times. He loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He didn't come to try and correct you. He came because he loves you. He didn't come to discipline you. He came because he loves you. There'll be some discipline. He didn't come to tell you that it's not good enough. You better shape up now. He came because he loves you. This is it. He came that you could experience eternal life. That life, that life of God. And he did it because he loves you. And he paid every price that all we have to do is believe. Just believe it. That's the process, I think, that we walk in over time, isn't it? Really learning to believe what he's done. There's not a hang of a lot else that we have to do. 
He's done everything. When he said it was finished, he meant it was finished. But we get to learn to believe how much he really loves us and what he's done. I'm going to share a couple of, um, a couple of uh, little stories about how this has manifested in my life. Obviously, there's a million billion, but he did it early with me. I'd been born again for about a day and a half or thereabouts. I was on this church camp, Methodist church uh, up in Kloof. And um, we'd gone away to the Drakensberg. I got born again. It was amazing. I had a real, tangible, radical encounter with God. And somehow between that and a day and a half later on the drive back to where I was staying, I'd managed to get suicidally depressed again. So I'm sitting in the car as the passenger and we're driving. And I just whispered in my heart. I didn't say it out loud. In my heart, I said to God, God, I've, I've messed this up as well even. I'm, I'm, I've, I've got saved now and even that I couldn't do properly. If you can't somehow show me that you've got a plan for my life and that you can use me and you want to do something with me, I'm going to kill myself when we get back to the house because I'm so pathetic. We got back to the house. I went into the bathroom. I locked the door. I broke open the razor. I had the razor blade. It was here on my wrist. I was staring into the mirror. Just like some tears in my eyes and that lump in your throat when you're kind of holding back a bit of a cry. But I was going to do it. I mean, I didn't do it. But I think I was going to do it. I was going to do it. And suddenly, I just hear these wheels, wheels spin into the, into the driveway of the house. I hear this knocking on the door. I hear these footsteps coming around. I hear a knock on the door of the bathroom, and I open it. And it's the youth pastor from the camp. And he's got a Bible, and he says, I felt God just so landmark. I had to come right now and give this to you. And these two scriptures I felt God highlighted for you. And one was, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And the other one was, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And he loved me. He loved me enough to do that. There's no way that guy felt like doing that after a long weekend serving and leading, and he got home, he wanted to be with his wife and hang out, but God loved me so much, he prompted him and he made this happen. He loved me and he loves you. He loves you enough to inconvenience everyone and anything around you whenever and wherever because he wants to show you his love. He does it in small things. I remember a few years ago, a number of years ago, I was in the Victory Gap Year house then, I think second year, maybe third. And um, it was my birthday. All my family was overseas. I wasn't married into my amazing new family, but I had the family of God, which is great. But I was walking up to this facility, and as I was walking up, I was just praying, and I felt God say to me, Alistair, I want to bless you today. I was like, cool, that's exciting. If God wants to bless you, that's amazing. Well, I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm, look, I'm anticipating something. Went through the day. was just busy. Um, I, I can't even remember what happened, but I got home late. It was probably around after 10 at night. It was dark. Everyone was asleep in the house. I went up to my room, and, um, and as I got there, I was about to climb into bed, just getting ready for bed, and as I was doing it, I was, I was disappointed, and I said, God, I thought you said you're going to bless me today, and nothing happened. As I had the thought, I just had the thought, and as I had the thought, the presence of God manifested so thickly in that room, and the joy of the Lord just came upon me, and I started to laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh, and I felt His joy, I felt His peace, I felt His presence, I felt His love, and I fell down on the floor laughing, and I couldn't stop until the guys in the room woke up and yelled at me and told me to shut up. <laughs> that wasn't part of His blessing, but He blessed me. My Father loved me, and He blessed me, and He wants to bless you too in every little thing, little things that other people don't even know about. He wants to pour out his love in your life. It's, um, I think one of the beautiful things with this is as God works this into our lives over time, it starts to become real. It starts to manifest. We start to believe it, to receive it, walk in it, and we start to get the privilege to reveal that to the people around us. This is what God does. I hope you realize that. In our walk with God, I can think, I can't think of any testimony where these two elements weren't involved. One, my personal relationship with God. It's God has to be involved. It has to be you and God. It can't be someone else's thing, someone else's. It can't just be a social gathering. It can't just be good feelings and having fun. That's not a testimony. That's not what God's about. And yet, it can't just be you and God. God always involves other people. It's always someone he adds you to. Someone he adds you to, someone he adds to you. Someone you work it, walk it out with, work it out with. If you don't have that, you're left with this mystical pie-in-the-sky spirituality that doesn't change anything, as was not part of what he intended with his kingdom because he wanted his kingdom to infiltrate everywhere, everyone, and we become his family. I've, uh, I lost my train of thought slightly, but back to 
the love manifesting with other people. It's not always easy, but it is always easy because it's him. And when it becomes real, it starts to manifest. I think some, some of the most um, real dynamics with it are with the people closest to you. My amazing wife and I have been married for about 14 years now. And just to share, the first, um, the first few were pretty rough. <laughs> we had some challenging times, probably our first sort of three years. We, um, we conflicted much over many things. <laughs> I think probably coming into marriage, we, we both had our best foot forward. And I mean, she's amazing and beautiful. And I thought, oh, she's perfect. Um, I don't know what she saw in me, but she, somehow she saw something enough to trick her into marrying me. But once we were married, we had a lot of conflict. We had a rough few years. I remember about three years in getting home the one day, um, parked my car outside, and, then, and I just sat for a bit longer. And I just sat and I waited, and I was like, God, actually, I don't even, I don't feel like going inside. And I was trying to talk to God, and I felt God say to me, Alistair, you love your wife. And I'm like, yeah, I love my wife. And he's like, no, Alistair, you love your wife. And I was like, yeah, I do, I love my wife. And I felt God say, Alistair, you really do love your wife. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I really do love my wife. I love her. And I got out of the car with this bubbling in my heart. And somehow between the car and the inside, we started having a fight again. <laughs> and we we're arguing and going. And God prompted me immediately and said, Alistair, show your wife how much you love her. And so I just stopped the conversation. She was still talking. And I just started saying, Marina, I love you. And she wasn't listening to me. And I was like, I really love you. And I started walking closer to her. And she started pushing me away. And I was like reaching and grabbing her and, and hugging her and trying to kiss her. And she was pushing me away. And I was like, I love you. And then something, God did something. Something snapped there. It was just like his love exploded between us. And it was real. And we felt it. And suddenly the issues were gone. You know how God does that? It's never the issue. He does it in his personal relationship with us, doesn't he? He didn't come because of the issues to set things right. He came because he loved us. And he reveals his love to us. And I've just seen it manifest more and more and more in our relationship. Mostly from Mary inside to me, I can be, I can be odd. <laughs> Especially in years gone by, there were times I would sulk. I would literally go a couple of days and just, oh, I'm not talking to you, I'm just being quiet and sulky. And I, I, would, I was like lying on my bed going to sleep and then you just feel this warm body sneaking behind you and that hand come around you and that voice whispering, you, yeah, I love you and I'm proud of you. And you just realize there's nothing lovable about me right now. There's nothing to be proud of. But it melts your heart and it causes you to realign with your God and to walk with him in his ways because it's the love of God poured out amongst us. And I'm going to throw in a nugget here for married couples and those who will be. I got quite confused with this in the first year of our marriage. You know how it says in the word... Wives, submit to your husbands, and all things is unto the Lord. Right after that, it says, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church, laying your life down for her. I got very much caught on the first one. I thought it was my job as, my hus as the husband to make her submit to me in all things. <laughs> it's like, no, you have to do that. The Bible says it. I'm, you know, I'm going to make you know, that's my role to make sure that you do that. And I remember the day God said to me, That's not your role, Alice. So that's between me and her. That's what I told her to do. I'll help her with that. You do what I told you to do. I told you to love your wife. Stop trying to make her obey you or submit to you anything. It's between me and her. You <laughs> love your wife. Lay your life down for this woman. And, and as I started to get that, and I, and I think Marion will tell you I don't get it always right mostly, huh? but as, as I've started to get that, it's the love of God that changes every single relationship you're in. That you can sit in a meeting where you get wrongly accused of something and it doesn't matter because you're not there for yourself. You're not there for how, what you've done and what you've earned and what you should be and where you should be. You're there for the kingdom of God. And you love the people there. And you do whatever it takes to make sure that there's unity in the faith and in the body and in the relationships and in your marriage. And you pour your life out and it's the love of God. And it's not an effort because he does it towards you. And he does it for you. And he does it again. And then he does it again. It's the love of God. I want to share a little bit about um, what he's brought us into. Again, obviously, not even close to comprehensive, just touching a couple of things. Colossians 1 verse 13 says this. He has conveyed us from the power of darkness, other translations say from the dominion of darkness, into the kingdom of the son of his love. He has. It is done. Finished. Past tense. 
I want you to engage with me in something quickly. I want you to all please close your eyes if you would be so kind. Please close your eyes. God's given us an imagination. It's from him. It's his gift to us. It's a, it's a gift and an ability to picture something in your mind that God can speak to you. It's part of the way he speaks to us that as we believe it, see it, and start to walk in it, it begins to manifest. It's not the enemy's playground. So I want you to imagine right now that, that dominion of darkness. Picture yourself there. Picture yourself in that dominion of darkness, a place of wickedness where the enemy rules, where you're bound. Picture that. That's what the word says. You were bound in the dominion and in the power of darkness. Then I want you to picture on the horizon the kingdom of the son of his love, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his love, the kingdom of his peace, of his joy, of his presence. I want you to see that picture. And then I want you to see yourself being conveyed. It says you were conveyed. Picture yourself being conveyed into this new kingdom. Do you see it? Can you see that picture? It's beautiful. You're welcome to open your eyes when you're ready. The beautiful thing about this is he says he has done that. If you're born again, it is done. When we were in that kingdom of darkness, it didn't matter how successful you were. You could be the most intelligent. You could be the most successful, the richest, the wisest. The, you could have everyone following after you and clamoring after you. You could be getting it all right, winning all the accolades, and you're still in the kingdom of darkness. You're still in this dark, dangerous, unsafe place of torment. You can be the hero in that place, but who cares? It sucks. But now, he says, you are now in the kingdom of the son of his love, of marvelous light. You can mess it up. You can trip. You can say the wrong thing a hundred times in a row. You can offend everyone you know. You can rob, kill, kill, steal, and plunder. Difficult to believe that one, isn't it? But you can do all of that, and you're still in the kingdom of his light. You are there. He's positioned you there. He's done it. It's past tense. It has been completed on your behalf with nothing to do with your ability, nothing to do with how you can earn it, and nothing to do how well you have done or will ever do. That's where he's placed you. That's where you are now. You're in this beautiful, amazing, wonderful kingdom. And as that starts to explode in our hearts of what he's finished and where he's placed us, it creates that environment for us to begin to grow. It's so beautiful. It says in um, Ephesians 1 verse 6, this one was life-changing for me. It says, you, ha you have been accepted in his beloved. Let's read Ephesians chapter 1. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. A lot of things that he's done for us. It says, you have been accepted in his beloved. You know what that means for me? By the way, it means it for you as well. You should lay hold of this for yourself, but I'm going to share what it means for me. It means it's impossible to reject me. It means in this setting of believers, anywhere in the world, I can walk into anyone's household, anywhere, anytime. If you're a believer and I'm a believer, that's the beloved. I'm accepted. You can't reject me. It's not possible. You could try. You could try and do it, you could do it by mistake, or you could even deliberately try and do it, but you, you can't actually achieve it. You can be rude to me. You can ignore me. You can pretend I'm not there. You can get busy and forget to greet me as I come past. You can hear my opinion and my desire to serve God and, and it not be good enough, but you can't reject me. It's not possible because I'm accepted. He says, you have been accepted in the beloved. That is what I have done for you. I have accepted you in my beloved, which means we are accepted in his beloved. You, there's nothing you can do to change that. It's just such good news. What he has brought us into, you are part of it. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 18 says this, God has set the members in the body where it pleases him. So just a little aside, you do realize that there's only one body of Christ, Right? Is one church, one body of Christ, one Father, one Son, Jesus, who is the head of the church, one Holy Spirit who indwells and fills all of the church, only one. I just want to mention this. I mean, Jesus had this problem pop up. Jesus is busy with his disciples and doing the things of the Father, advancing the kingdom, and the disciples came to him and said, hey, what about those guys over there? They're also baptizing. They're doing this. Should we go and shut them down? And Jesus is like, what are you talking about? I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But he says, what are you talking about? We're not shutting them down. If they're not against us, then they're for us. Can we celebrate them, please, and carry on with what we're called to do? 
Paul had the problem. He had to address it in one of the epistles. He's like, you guys are all clamoring, saying, no, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Paul, and I'm of this, and I'm of that. And he says, stop with your nonsense. There's one body, one Lord and Savior of all of us. Let's celebrate Jesus and what we're part of, and then let's busy ourselves where God's called us to be busy. Having said that, though, he chooses to set us in certain places with certain people. Jesus, when he prayed that final prayer in John 17, he said, Father, the ones that you've given to me, of the ones you've given to me, I've lost none of them except the son of perdition. You know that God gives you to people? That's the discipleship process. That's what Jesus commanded when he left. Go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. How do you teach someone to obey something? Not easily, I guarantee you that. You can teach someone, one plus one is two. Can you do it? One plus one is two. Okay, one plus one, okay, you've taught them. But to teach someone to obey something, I do that with my kids. I can tell you what it involves. It involves a hang of a lot of love. You can't teach someone to obey something if they don't know they're loved. If they don't feel safe, secure, loved, you can't teach them to obey. And it, in, it includes a hang of a lot of repetition, it includes a fair number of smack bums, all part of what we experience in the household of God. This is what he's brought us into. This is what he has set us in. He set us. I have set each member in the body where it pleases me, says the Lord. Not necessarily where it pleases us, where it pleases him. He didn't say, I have balanced each member in the body on a teetering edge, so they may or may not hang in there, I don't know. He doesn't say, I've loosely attached each member in the body on the side somewhere where they think they might feel okay. No, he says, I, I, God, has set each member in the body where it gives him pleasure. He knows what you don't know. Such a, such a blessing, such a, be a blessing to be placed in the household of God. I think... Um, I think lastly in this section, I want to share around this one, which for me is probably one of the coolest ones for me. What has he brought us into? He's brought us into death and life. Death, why death? Because the old has died. Why life? Because he's brought us into everything of his life. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things become new. Baptism is a picture of this. You go down in the water, the old man dies, stays behind. You come up into newness of life in Christ Jesus. And this is my scripture, though, which speaks to me so often. Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul said this. I witness with it. I say it now. I hope you do too. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is so liberating. This will set you free forever when you get it. I remember when I was first starting to meditate on this. It was in my first year at Gap Year. I was right here. I was kneeling down. We were doing some skit or other, which I trust impacted people's lives. But at the, at the time we were doing it, it just felt silly and irritating. So I was kneeling down here. We were acting out some skit. Behind me was the rest of the team. There was one girl that I quite liked. I could hear her engaging flirtatiously with one of the other guys. And it was grating me up the wrong way, and I was getting irritated. I was like, Argh. and I felt in that moment, I felt God say to me, What's the problem? I thought it was, wasn't you who live anymore. <laughs> How can you get irritated and feel funny emotions if it's not you who live, if it's me who's living through you? And it set me free that moment. It was like, Of course. How can I ever get upset about anything? Why would I ever get upset about anything if it's not me who's living? It's Christ who's living in me. My life is in Him. It changes your life forever. It sets you free forever. It takes away the, the what about me? And what, what am I going to do? And what will I get? Imagine if I had been silly enough to ignore that prompting of God and try and engage in something there and wasted a year of my life instead of ending up with this woman. The most amazing wife I could ever be blessed with. I was able to focus not on other emotions and nonsense, but what God had for me. And he added the right wife at the right time, which has led to above and beyond what I could think, ask, or imagine. He's brought us into so much, and the joy of it is he's done it. What has God got for you? I'll share a couple of thoughts. Many, many things, a couple of things that I that are laid on my heart right now. He's got greatness for you. We'll get back to that. He's got maturity for you. He's got people he wants to give you. 
And the most beautiful of all, he's got himself for you. Greatness. Matthew 20, 26 to 27. I remember many years ago, I thought I wanted to one day preach a sermon on the call to greatness. It was something that resonated in my heart about it. I've meditated on the scripture much since then. Uh, James and John were, were wanting uh, positions of influence. They were wanting to be recognized. They were wanting power. They were wanting to have, uh, feel like there was something special. They wanted to be seated at the left and right of Jesus and have a position of prominence. And Jesus said to them, Sorry, guys, you, don't, you misunderstand my kingdom. You misunderstand what you're part of. This is not what I've got for you. Greatness, in that sense, is not what I've got for you. Prominence, in that sense, is not what I've got for you. I'll tell you what I've got for you. Servanthood. That's what I've got for you. Pouring out your life. That's what I've got for you. And when you've done it, you can do it again. And when you've done it again, you can do it again. And when you think you've been faithful with it for 10 years, I've got a deeper level of it for you more again. And I'll promote, I'm actually, I'll really bless you. I'm going to promote you to a place that can, you can pour your life out even more than what you ever thought you could. That's what he's got for you. I remember in this setting, one of, one of the areas that manifested for me was, um, I think it must have been my second year at VGY, I can't remember. We were sitting right here. We'd come along to the worship practice that evening. I wanted to join the team. I love uh, worshiping the Lord with song. It's one of the things that um, God's done in my heart. I really enjoy it. And at the time, I was wanting to get into guitar more, and I thought, I want to join the worship team and do what they do up here. I was sitting right there, and as I was sitting there, they were busy splitting the teams up and all the new people who were going to go with the different areas. And I was about to get up and go, and God said to me, I want you to start on the sound. So I said, okay, Lord, I'll do that. And I'm thinking three weeks. Eight years later, I managed to hand the sound over to some other people. I wasn't particularly good at it. I didn't particularly enjoy it, to be honest. But God asked me to do it, and I did it. And he always knows better. He always knows better. In the process of it, I grew, I learned. So many of those broken things in my life I mentioned at the start got changed in this setting of, of serving in that way. I got the privilege of people giving me attitude and look, giving me funny looks when I, I did nothing wrong. I was jolly serving, and people turn around and give you a glare every time something isn't wrong. I remember the one time. Um, this guy came wandering up and asked me you know, about some other recording. I was like, oh, sorry, we didn't record that. He's like, oh, you've robbed me. How can you do that to me? I wanted to lean over the counter and punch him in the face. I'm like, I robbed you. I was here like three hours before you and three hours after you. <laughs> What's your issue? But, but God knows better. He puts you in these places through the process of all these things. He grew things in me that I could interact with people, that I could deal with people, that I could grow in responsibility and all those issues that I battled with. He places you in in the body of Christ, to serve, to be part, to contribute, and in, in the doing of that, you grow. That's what he's got for us, maturity. Carry on from what I'm saying. Ephesians 4.16, it's speaking all in and around the fivefold ministry of God for the purpose of the equipping of the saints. Praise the Lord. Exciting what we're doing. I'm so excited about that stuff. Equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Why? Why does he want to equip the saints for the work of the ministry? Because he says that every joint should supply. Every member should be contributing. Because he says when you do that, you will grow together into Christ, into the fullness of Christ, the full representation of Christ as a body. We can never, ever, ever achieve that on our own. It's not possible. No one of us can do that. He's Jesus. But the full body of Christ coming together and contributing what he's placed inside of each one of you each one of us, when we get to do that, this picture starts to come together and we start to grow to maturity. We begin to influence each other. We can't just stagger in here on a once a week, enjoy whatever's happening and walk out and think we're a Christian. We're part of something. He's made you part of something. I'll use that same analogy I used earlier. I don't know if you're part of a big family where you do Sunday lunches. I've had the privilege of being part of that with my amazing wife. Um, if you haven't been, invite yourself to someone else's family. I'm sure you'll be welcome. <laughs> we are the family of God. But what happens at these times? You rock up. You can get away with something like this for one or two or three weeks. You could rock up and bring nothing and not help prepare anything and not serve anything and not clean up anywhere. And everyone would probably smile and love, you know, have family happy. If you keep doing that after a while, it's only a matter of time until someone gives you a firm prod on the side and says, hey, 
Can you bring the drinks this time? Oh, can you pour that for us? Can you lay that table? Can you go and do the, your turn on the dishes? It's the family of God. Who wants to be that person who just sits happily in the corner and never does anything and never contributes anything? That's not who we want to be. Why do I say this to you? Because God has put something in you for all of us. You can walk in here sometimes and think to yourself, oh, they didn't do that right. Oh, and they're only busy with this. Why are they not doing that in the community? And why are they not busy with that up Africa? And what about those people there? You know why that's not happening yet? Because God's called you to do it. If you're having that thought, God is speaking to you about it. God wants you to contribute that so that you can come and say, this is what God's laid on our, my heart. How can we do this together? How can we co-labor? And in the process of it, we grow up into the full maturity, becoming like Christ. This is what he's got for you. He gives people to you. I'm not going to overemphasize it, but he does this for us. He first adds you to people, like Jesus said. Father, the ones that you've given me I haven't lost. There's a process of being discipled. But at some point, God wants to give people to you as well, that you can be that person that God says, I'm entrusting these people to you. And you also make sure that none of them get lost, none of them lose away. You help them. That's what God wants to do in your life. That's what he's got for you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with this. He's got himself for us. He's got himself for us. This, for me, is what makes everything else worthwhile. This is how you do everything else, because he's with us. He draws us into himself. I could share a million other little stories of every day of my life, how he encounters me. And he does it for all of us. He's there for all of us. You can, the one time I remember God said to me, you can be as close to me as you choose to be. I've made it all available. You just choose it. Just make time. Just push in. I'm going to share out of the story of Peter. You know, Peter, do you remember the first, one of the first times Jesus encountered him in the boat? Jesus stepped into his boat, and he performed this amazing miracle with the fish, and the fish were teeming in, and there were, you know, there was too many, and the boat was about to sink, and Peter was like, got the guys together and brought some order and pulled that in and secured the boat, secured the catch, got blown away, wow, Jesus is amazing and he can do this for me and I'm not worthy and I want to serve him and he knelt down and he committed his life to the Lord to walk with him. Add on three years, fast forward. Similar boat, Jesus has now died and risen again. They've encountered him in certain places and now Peter and some of the disciples are fishing. They'd fished through the whole night, caught nothing again. And they hear a voice from shore, and the voice says, why don't you throw your nets on the other side? They do it, and the fish come teeming into the nets again. Do you know what Peter's reaction is? He doesn't try and secure them. He doesn't try and bring order. He doesn't care. The second he understands that it's Jesus there, he just dives in. He just dives into the water, and he swims for shore, and he gets up on land, and he just wants to be with them. He just wants to be with Jesus. The Bible then doesn't tell us what happens between the two of them in between that and the, the rest getting to the shore. So they, had a, they just had an extra time together. They just got to be together for an extra set of time because that's all Peter cared about. And that's what he's got for us. Encounters with him, closeness with him, intimacy with him, growing relationship with him, his love. I'm going to wrap it up here. God really wanted me to tell you, I believe today, remind you that he loves you. He loves you every day, in every way. He really, really loves you. He's brought you into something amazing in his kingdom. It's a finished work. It's completed. It's done. It's paid for. And he's got so much for you. I mean, the few things I've shared now haven't begun to even touch the iceberg on what God's got for you, but he's got so much for you.